Number 26, Theodore Roosevelt, Republican, 1901 to 1909, age 42, from New York. The Republicans' worst nightmare had come to pass. Theodore Roosevelt was no longer just a heartbeat from the presidency. He was the president. T.R., as he liked to be called, was a complicated man, a mass of contradictions, and he could not be bullied. He was a conservative, yet he fought for reform. He was a hunter who started the conservation movement, a hawk on war who won the Nobel Peace Prize. Perhaps the only thing that can be easily understood about him is that he was an original. T.R. never identified himself as a Republican. In fact, I've read a letter recently that's been unpublished that his uncle wrote and said what they don't understand about Teddy is that he's a Democrat, that he was both. He never thought in terms of pure party politics. He thought about what was right for the American people. And that's a great lesson for presidents to learn. You don't represent your party as much as you represent the people. If you do what's right for the most people, what you think's right, you're going to be a great president. Teddy Roosevelt was the most exciting man you ever met. And it didn't matter who you were. That's just what he was like. He was impossibly energetic. He was constantly doing things, constantly reading things, constantly thinking about things and talking about things. What struck people about Theodore Roosevelt was just how much energy he had. He was a teetotaler, didn't drink alcohol, but drank a gallon of coffee a day. So he was wired all the time. Roosevelt was one of these people who sucked the air out of every room that he was in. He exuded charisma in a way that required everybody to pay attention. Theodore Roosevelt, without question, was the most electrifying politician of his generation. Roosevelt was also a shrewd politician. He knew politics were driven by personality, and he used the sheer force of his personality to get what he wanted. Every issue with Teddy Roosevelt is affected by his personality. I mean, maybe more than any president we have ever had, his personality infused uh, his politics and either won him supporters or bitter enemies. He believed in good and evil. He believed that a single individual could have a large impact on the course of affairs. He had this sense that there was room in national life, even in this modern industrial age, for the same kind of selfless heroism that he had read about in the hero stories of the past. Roosevelt did not waste much time going after what he thought was America's greatest evil, too much power in the hands of corporate America. When Roosevelt becomes president, it was a toss up who the most powerful man in the country was. It might have been Theodore Roosevelt, the president of the United States, or it might have been J.P. Morgan, the most powerful financier in the country. Roosevelt came to believe that the great industrialists in the United States did, in fact, wield too much power. And he decided that this should be curbed. Five months into office, Roosevelt took J.P. Morgan head on. He sued the tycoon's Northern Securities Corporation to halt its monopolization of the Western Railways. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in a close decision, the government was successful. Morgan's monopoly was crushed. As a result, Roosevelt gained a reputation as a trust buster. But in truth, he was a trust regulator. His underlying view was that large size in industry is something that comes with the territory of the Industrial Revolution. We can't turn back the clock on that. However, we have to remind these corporate barons that the people, not the trusts, not the capitalist system, but the people control affairs in this country. The thing that TR feared was that if he couldn't get corporate America to let a little steam out of the pot, it would blow up. Lingering societal ills were bubbling over. 
there were no sanitation systems, highways, or social welfare. In New York, poor people starved. Across America, one child out of five worked in a factory, mine, or sweatshop. Conditions for laborers were miserable, particularly coal miners. So it was not a surprise when the anthracite coal miners went on strike in 1902. Management and labor were hopelessly deadlocked and winter was looming. Without coal, the entire Northeast would freeze. Fearing untold misery and riots, the president personally intervened. Roosevelt took the view that the president of the United States was uniquely positioned to act on behalf of the American people. It's only the president who, who can see and who must see things in terms of the entire national interest. And when he saw what the coal strike threatened to do to America as a whole, he felt obliged to take action. After threatening to nationalize the coal mines, Roosevelt brought the two sides together and forged a settlement that favored labor over management. The coal strike was over, and Roosevelt's first great domestic crisis was averted, much to the relief of the nation. He never wanted to feel that one tycoon, one billionaire, could shut the whole railroad system down or could knock out the entire coal industry. It would cripple America. He never wanted to see anybody have the power that could hurt the country. Roosevelt's resolution of the strike was a crucial turning point in labor relations, paving the way to better working conditions. It would be one triumph in many of social and economic reforms that Roosevelt called his square deal. What Roosevelt had in mind for foreign policy, however, would be much more radical. While president, Theodore Roosevelt officially renamed the executive mansion the White House and added the West Wing. Theodore Roosevelt had been the greatest political force behind the Spanish-American War. He saw America's emergence as a world power not only necessary for survival, but a duty. He felt Americans had a responsibility to civilize the rest of the world. He made the country realize that we now, in a post-Spanish-American War era, had a global responsibility. We were no longer a country being born, that we were now a world leader. And that with that came a new kind of global responsibility. Roosevelt, more than anybody, believed America needed a canal through the Central American Isthmus owned by Colombia. The thought was this canal was going to be a way to protect both seas of America, that any moment if the East Coast was attacked, the West Coast fleet could quickly come to its aid. Now, Roosevelt believed this canal, the Panama Canal, would be a very good thing for the United States, but he believed it would also be a very good thing for the world. The Colombian government didn't exactly agree with Roosevelt, at least not at the price he was offering. So, once again, Roosevelt took unorthodox measures. He backed a local revolution and helped create the nation of Panama in exchange for the right to build a canal there. He was criticized very heavily for his high-handed role in dealing with the government of an independent American republic, for basically giving them the back of his hand, and for fomenting revolution. But he never apologized. He used to say, I didn't steal the Panama Canal, I built it. It was the largest engineering project ever undertaken. And when it was completed, it became one of the wonders of the world. When it opened, Roosevelt believed that that was his major contribution to world civilization. He never changed his mind about that. But America was not the only one infiltrating Latin America. Increasingly, European powers were moving into the region, ostensibly for the purpose of forcing debtor nations to repay their loans. Roosevelt found their presence a strategic threat. Without consulting Congress or asking permission from Latin America, Roosevelt invoked the Monroe Doctrine and stated that the U.S. was now in charge of the Western Hemisphere. Roosevelt announced that henceforth the United States would consider that it held a police power, that was the term he used, to enforce good behavior on the countries of the Western Hemisphere. This was simply his way of saying, if somebody has to clean up the neighborhood, it's going to be the United States. It was a position to take, and Roosevelt backed it up with what he called 
big stick diplomacy. I mean, his famous quote is, speak softly and carry a big stick. Meaning you don't have to yell at people abroad, but at every minute you have to be militarily prepared. The big stick is your arsenal. It is your navy. And this was a way of intimidating other countries in realizing that we were going to fight for American rights. If you sacked a consulate somewhere or if you intercepted and impressed an American ship, there were going to be consequences. In 1904, Roosevelt was elected by the largest popular margin in American history up to that time. Joyous, Roosevelt told the country he considered this to be his second term, and he promised not to run again. It was a public statement he would come to regret. As popular as Roosevelt was, progressive-minded Americans thought he could do more for social and economic reform. The influx of new immigrants, over 8 million in the first decade of the 20th century alone, had turned life for the working class from bad to intolerable. Intending to expose the horrific conditions experienced by immigrant workers inside a Chicago meat plant, author Upton Sinclair sent shockwaves across the nation with his book, The Jungle. It was an expose of the meat packing industry. The conditions that were terrible, they didn't have bathrooms, they had toilets. There was nothing like a sink where you washed your hands. Um, it was a mess. Rats running in and out of the place and dropping down under these big grinding machines and lurid stories about it, you know, workers falling in there or just all kinds of bad things. Roosevelt responded immediately, realizing it was an opportunity for the federal government to act on behalf of the consumer. In 1906, he obtained passage of the Meat Inspection Act, as well as the Pure Food and Drug Act. Also in 1906, Roosevelt created the Antiquities Act. This was the authorization he needed to halt the destruction of the American landscape. There was a sense that uh, as the frontier closed, uh, the wildness of America maybe was disappearing. And Roosevelt noticed this on some of his Western trips. They were going to destroy the Grand Canyon until TR intervened. And what Roosevelt said is, no, these places, these pristine wilderness spots are the heirlooms of America. As surely as the priceless masterpieces in the Louvre, these are what we've got to save for our children. By the end of his term, Roosevelt had preserved more than 230 million acres of land. But it's only one part of his legacy. He also created better labor conditions, business regulations, and strengthened America's position on the world stage. I think Teddy Roosevelt was a good president, and the main reason I say that is foreign policy. He had a vision, he had plans, and he made them happen. Theodore Roosevelt was the first president to realize what an important moral position the president had simply by being president. A president represents the American people. The president can articulate the views of the American people, but he can also influence those views and to mobilize the American people behind important reforms. Theodore Roosevelt's legacy is with us every time you turn on a faucet and take a sip of water that's not contaminated. It's with you every time you cook a hamburger on a grill and know you're not going to die from it. It's with you every time you want to take a hike uh, through the Sierra Nevada mountains or go for a swim in the Great Lakes. Roosevelt agonized over leaving the presidency. There was so much more he wanted to do. But, true to his word to the American people, he did not run for re-election in 1908. It was a decision that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Theodore Roosevelt was the first president to fly in an airplane, own an automobile, and dive in a submarine. 